the morbidly made i am michael j and i'm john rhodes we are here to do what no one has done in the podcasting world as of yet although you know let's start this right off by saying this is not a podcast it's definitely not yeah this is a horror radio show for the fans by the fans where the fans can kind of come together and debate each other on different topics well, it's a little bit more than that, too. It's not even really debate. It's the fact that we can come together on this venue and express our love. Whether it's indie horror fucking web series or it's the next blockbuster remake. Exactly. And also, you know, with guests, you guys have the opportunity to speak with them, ask them questions, kind of get inside their head which I don't think anybody has ever given that opportunity before. No, definitely not. And how many of you out there would love the chance to sit down with Robert England or Tyler Main or Derek Mears, any one of those? That is an opportunity that we here would love to give to each and every single one of you. Oh, definitely. And I mean, it's going to happen. Um, we do have the connections. But uh, right now, John, why don't you get into uh, telling them what we're going to do here today? All right, today, first off, what we wanted to do is we wanted to address something that everyone could relate to in the horror community. So we wanted to start off with your favorite slasher. Now, we didn't want to just be f- slasher franchise and limit it in any way, shape, or form. We wanted your favorite slasher, period, the end, regardless of who it is. Right. It can be the... Um mainstream you know everybody's favorite jason freddy michael or maybe an indie slasher maybe well can victor crawley be be um described as indie anymore or has he kind of moved into the mainstream I, I don't know that's that's a very good question he definitely started off indie damn he's got so much power that he's he's almost mainstream i would want to say not quite mainstream yet but he's damn close right and i mean hatchet 3 is coming and that is the basically third movie of the series so I, I think he has some clout by now. I, I really do. And honestly, Hatchet 2 did get a theatrical release. Now, no matter how much they got fucked out of that, it got a theatrical release. So that's somewhat mainstream right there. Right. And you live actually out in the middle of Pennsylvania, I believe, because we're both from PA. So you're out in the middle You're out in the middle of the state. Was that... Um, didn't Hatchet 2 get a release kind of in your area? Uh, it got a release in Pittsburgh, which is about two hours south of me. I'm a little bit away from the middle. I'm slightly towards uh, Lake Erie. So, but yeah, it was about two hours away. Unfortunately, I didn't get the chance to go on the one weekend it was open. Right. And I'm out in Philly, and obviously it was not here, unfortunately. So, just to jump straight into this, me and Mike decided on something. We wanted to do something slightly different. We were going to address our favorite slasher, but with that, we also wanted to shine a little bit of light on the lesser knowns, the ones that we would choose after our absolute favorite because we didn't want to just stick with the exact same old, same old. So, Mike, if you would like to actually jump straight into your choice, your first choice, your main favorite, which everyone knows, I'll get mine, and then we'll go straight into the second choice, which we think people should consider a hell of a lot more than they do. Anyone that knows me, and I'm sure if you know me from the Skeleton Crew and Rabbit and Red Radio, you'll know that I love Halloween. So Michael Myers, for me, is just the be-all and end-all. But since we really don't want to explore that, I mean, I've explored it enough to the point where I just don't want to talk about it anymore. But... um. 
I would have to go with another one, kind of like um, the nice backup. Uh, I like uh, Matt Cordell from Maniac Cop a lot. I don't know if, uh, John, that's that's one that you're kind of familiar with, but that is one that um, he's always just been, I don't know, the nice silent killer. And if you watch Maniac Cop, like that score, the whole... <laughs> I can't whistle to save my <laughs> life, but... <laughs> You know, no, we yeah. know what you mean, Mike. We know. Right, right. No, I, I, I am familiar. Honestly, I have not watched Maniac Cop since probably I was 13, 14, and I seeked it out. I remember greatly enjoying it, and I've wanted to rewatch it here again within the last couple of years, and I just have not got around to it. Yeah, it's one of those, and I mean, if you look at Maniac Cop too, it was very disappointing. Uh, well, not disappointing, but Bruce Campbell, I think, while he was a staple in the original... I was really kind of pissed off that he got killed um, less than halfway through the second film. Well, what can we say, Mike? Even Bruce Campbell has some standards. <laughs> All right, I feel kind of like a dick for saying that because I don't even—I've never even seen Maniac Cop two. Wait, you're kidding? You've never—you've only seen Maniac Cop. You've never seen Maniac Cop two or three? I might have. I can't swear that I have, honestly. Hmm. When I think of Maniac Cop, I remember seeing on HBO, one of the ones where uh, he was in a hospital and somebody was going across a catwalk and he got the uh, defibrillator and put it on the fucking railings and drilled him. That was great. Iconic. That was the that was the third one, actually. Really? Yep. Yeah, I remember as a kid catching that on HBO around Halloween. Yeah, that definitely classic, classic film. I mean, I like all three, but a lot of people say, uh, two and three are garbage. And I'll be like, eh, you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. If you're a fan of the franchise... I mean, it's hard to let go. So uh, let's get into John. What do you? Uh, what would you say yours, your favorite is? Well, my staple, the one that I always go to, which is stereotypical, typical, bah, can't talk right now, is uh, Jason Voorhees, Friday the Thirteenth, and it's because it's iconic. When you say slasher to somebody, they think of fucking Jason. But to move past that, because that's been talked about so much with the Skeleton Crew and every other podcast out there, I wanted to shine light on a different slasher. And I went in a completely different direction than Mike. My choice is actually Babyface from The Hills Run Red. Oh, bravo, sir. Now, see, bravo. I went with Babyface because he breaks the mold on a fucking slasher. This guy talks. This guy is smart, he's perfectly normal, he's human, he dies normally, but he's intelligent. He wears a bulletproof vest, he can pick up your fucking gun and shoot you with it. If you drop your cell phone, or if your friend drops their cell phone and you stick together, he's going to call you and track you down by that. I love that, but yet he's also got the, the silent aspect to him most of the time, and he's just a brute that'll run through freaking doors and throw you around like a ragdoll. I loved it. Do you think that that kind of takes away from their ability to be scary and frightening to people? It depends. I mean, you run into some problems. Now, if they're talking, you can run into the Freddy Krueger problem. Now, the first one, Freddy was fucking scary. He, he was. There's no question about it. Yeah, but as the series went, he just became the talking clown, right? He was just the cliche. He ran his mouth way too much. He was just trying to be funny at that point. That's the problem right there. Now, with Babyface, he said, I think, a total of one line. And it was surprising, the fact that he said it. And it was surprising that when he said it, he sounded perfectly normal. And I think that if a slasher talks, he shouldn't talk a lot. You lose impact when he talks a lot. You take, you add too much humanity to him. But when you do have him talk and it's surprising, I think that helps, actually. To me, with The Hills Run Red, that was one of the moments that just stuck with me. I was like, holy shit! So, in a sense... It kind of adds emotion, is what you're saying. It, it definitely does, but it's got to be done right. I mean, if you do it wrong, you're just screwing the pooch on it. Right. And you, you know what's weird? As we were talking, I actually thought of another kind of uh, modern-day slasher that's kind of overlooked, maybe. I mean, he hasn't been around for that long. I think only about um, maybe four years or so. But how about uh, Chrome Skull from Late to Rest? Now, see, here's my thing. is I was debating, actually, between three choices for my second one, and I did not decide until last night, actually. Um, I was debating between Babyface, Leslie Vernon, and Chrome Skull. And my deciding factor was is that Leslie Vernon is funny and charismatic, but once he puts on the mask, he, he's stereotypical. He's just like Michael and Jason. 
and he loses what defines him. So I kind of excluded him on that. And Babyface won because of the things that he did that separated him out to me. And Chrome Skull, well, he does separate himself out. To me, it was not enough. I mean, I love Chrome Skull. I think what he does is great. I just think that Babyface better defined a modern slasher to me. Now, those of you that out there think that I'm retarded, that's fine. I'm sure there are some people. I'm more than willing to hear your opinions. I mean, my guy, Babyface, lasted one movie. But I, I think that he went outside the boundaries of a normal slasher enough to make himself somewhat iconic. But I, I do have to give you my pointing out Chrome Skull. That is excellent because the guy that played Chrome Skull also was in Madison County as that slasher. This guy is a great, great killer on film. I like him a lot. Yeah, I mean that's Madison County is actually one that I have to check out. It's on my it's on my watch pile, which is getting increasingly um, larger, and <laughs> my time is getting less and less. But what can you do? Let's go to the phones and actually take some calls from uh, people that also want to weigh in on this topic. What do you say? Uh, I'm totally for that. I think we got a couple people ready to call in. We do have Dylan with us, right? Yes, indeed, you do. Well, all right. What's up, buddy? Who's your favorite slasher? Uh, I'm going to have to go out on a limb and say it's Michael Myers by far. All right. Now, Mike's already said Michael Myers. What is your argument? Why do you think Michael Myers is the best fucking slasher out there? Because he hasn't died. <laughs> every, every other famous movie slasher has died. Freddy Krueger dies in every movie. Like, he's defeated anyway. He doesn't die. He gets banished to back to where he's from. He, the only reason he was created is because... He was killed. Right. Jason right. Is, is the first movie's not even Jason. It's his mom. Jason's already dead before the movie starts, so he's an immortal being. Jason's defeated to the point where he goes to hell. He comes back from hell. But Michael Myers is human. He has he doesn't wear vests. He doesn't he doesn't wear armor. And he has a, like a, a butcher knife. <laughs> Low. He's demeaning. He doesn't talk. And he wears a jumper. <laughs> like, all, right. all right all right now see i i like that the aspect that you know he's human and you you appreciate that i like that and i know mike probably wants to weigh in on this well, I, okay <laughs> here's my thing though but i understand that he didn't die in every movie but but see he gets shot six times in the first one so do we count that as him not dying fuck yeah. no he doesn't die dude he's in part two well, I, yeah, but that, but he comes back People to get life. shot all the time. Right. <laughs> so then you're and saying that for, Loomis missed is what you're saying. No, Loomis could have easily hit him. I mean, it's it just, shows that he gets shot in the, the upper chest region. That's not a killing blow. Okay. Oh. Limb shots won't kill, especially with the kind of gun Loomis was using. He was using a 32 revolver, if I'm not mistaken. Right. And that's not, it's not a powerful gun. It's a cop issue gun because they are mandated to use a gun that caliber will more than likely injure than kill. Because a cop doesn't want to kill somebody. That's not what they want to do. So Lewis's gun wasn't, it's, yes, it's created to kill, but it's more of a, a stopping mechanism than anything. And, and I'll actually weigh in for Dylan here. I mean, Loomis is not a trained shooter. He, he's probably not had any experience. So he shot six times. Who's to say he hit him all six times? He might hit him once or twice. And okay. you know, Michael's a badass. Enough to push somebody back. Yeah. But, I mean, in Halloween 2, Loomis clearly says, I, I, I shot him in the heart. I, I, <laughs> I just have to throw that in there. Says just... that yeah. doesn't mean it happened. Like, I can say I jumped up the Empire State Building. doesn't make it so. <laughs> right. Just because he's a trained psychologist and been chasing Michael's entire life does not mean that what he says is what happened. It's true. It's right. true. But how Just about because... how about how about though in Halloween two? Do you <laughs> think that now because this is something that look I'm a I'm a diehard fan of the series I love it, but I still well except for season of the witch that just sucks. Well. <laughs> we'll probably disagree on that one because I mean, look, I hated Season of the Witch too when I was younger. But I mean, the older that I get, I kind of have a, a different sort of appreciation for it for whatever reason. I don't know why. It's a good movie. It just has nothing to do with Michael Myers. No, exactly. It's great. Exactly. Great, great. Exactly. Yeah. If you want a horror movie about you know Stonehenge, 
go for it. But if you want Michael Myers, skip that one. Right. Yeah. Don't don't call it Halloween if it's not Michael Myers. Right. <laughs> but but back to the the Halloween two thing. Now I know that he survived it, but I mean we're at a point where he just I mean he basically gets blown up. I I still it's very tough for me to believe that he didn't die in that one and then come back, even though he was lying comatose for 10 years, I would still think that somewhere in there he had to die and then come back. I think of it as this. Mm-hmm. As unpolitically correct as it is, Michael Myers is retarded. Right. He's retarded. <laughs> Michael oh. Myers has that typical mentally handicapped strength. Right. They are stronger. They are much faster. Nobody knows why, but they are. And they can sure as hell take a lot more. You can watch one guy of the same build as, like, Michael Myers get tackled easily, but if, he, if it was a mentally incapacitated person, like mentally handicapped, they'd be a lot harder to break down. Nobody knows why, but in real-life situations, that's how it is. Like, I've watched my old high school. This kid, no bigger than me, and I'm – you can ask anybody. I'm a small guy. I'm tall. It took four police officers to bring him down. Four. And his so, only thing, he's mentally handicapped. Yeah, they do have that retard know. strength. I think he's. Yeah, I we think he just trumped you, Mike. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, it, it's bound <laughs> to happen. I... Plus, because you know, it's, it's obvious that Michael Myers is mental in a way. Like he's obviously mentally disturbed. That's obvious in the first one. Oh fuck yeah! I mean, he yeah. killed his sister for absolutely no apparent reason. Right. He's not just a, a plain sociopath. He is handicapped. Yeah, there is some disturbed part of him going on. That boy ain't right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, honestly, Michael Myers is just a victim of his time. Okay, now, I'll give you that he's retarded, and he's super strong and tough as hell, and clever, too, from H2O, which oh, yeah. I, I call as a bullshit cop-out for a sequel, but clever, if hey. you want to give it to him. How about Buster Rhymes beating his ass down and killing him, though? Are, can he, he doesn't do, kill him though. He doesn't kill him. Okay, explain At that. At the one. very, very end of the movie, after the credits, you see the nurses rolling in Michael's body. No autopsy's been done. They are about yeah. to do the autopsy. He's on the table. It goes to black, and you hear him wake up. Mike it was sh- shocked him. Um, oh, he did. Well, actually, you're right. But he didn't die, even though <laughs> I've never watched the end of Halloween Resurrection because. I get freaked out by it when they open up the body bag and you see him open, you know, and you see his eye open. I don't, first of all, I don't, yeah. like, I don't like people that get burned anyway. People that are in bandages scare the shit out of me. Holy fuck. I cannot believe I just witnessed a caller trump Mike it's, on his knowledge of Halloween. I know. it's a Hey, I yeah, but I said that he didn't die because he didn't die. That's true. Because yeah. he still woke up. People get electrocuted all the time. People are, are struck by lightning, and that is nowhere near enough electrical current that Buster Adams was putting through Michael Myers. <laughs> All he did was paralyze him. He shut down his nervous system for a short period of time because that's what an electrical current will do. Yeah, It uh, stops your nervous system, yeah. which in turn stops him from feeling pain. Fucking right. I'll tell you. All he did was paralyze Michael Myers, but he also destroyed his pain sensory cortex. So Michael Myers didn't feel the burns. When he woke up, by all means, he could move, but he probably doesn't feel it. All right. Now, As I, of now, I, if they wanted to make a new movie, Michael Myers could be pain-free because his nerves could be burnt and shot because of the electricity, and he just feels nothing. All right, all right. I have to ask. You seem pretty knowledgeable. How the hell do you know this kind of stuff? I'm in college. <laughs> what are you going to college for? Friends of Anthropology. Wow. Okay, so you probably know a hell of a lot more than me or Mike put together. Exactly. I'll tell you, the callers that we get for this show is just, wow. I, I'm amazed. All right, Dylan, thank you for your support, man. You fucking Trump Mike. You blew me away. Oh, yeah. Um, Thank you very much, buddy. No problem. You're welcome back anytime, man, anytime. All right, works for me. I'll definitely call in again. All right, Mike, that was a great call that we actually just had. It was a total mind blower for me, sir. All right, we got one more, and then we're going to call it quits for this show. Who do we have? 
<laughs> Snap. Say my name. That would be good, Carl. <laughs> All right, well, apparently, oh, yeah, this is Justine. Hi. Hi. Hello. What's up, Justine? Oh, you know. So, uh, who is your favorite slasher? Well, all right, so I'm going to have to go with, like, classic, well, kind of classic slasher. I'm I'm going to have to say Freddy. Um, he He's a scary dream demon man. <laughs> he's terrifying. Okay, what puts Freddy over the top in your book? See... I mean, you got the good points that, you know, like, Jason and Michael, they're they're human, and yet, you know, they can't be killed, they're unstoppable. But Freddy really is. Like, you can't seriously kill him. He is in a dream. You know, there's no way, unless you bring him out of the dream and then into our mortal world and he loses all his powers, and then, yeah, you can kill him. But he really stays alive throughout time and everything, because once people start believing in him again and thinking about him again... He's right back in the dream world doing his thing and, you know, killing people with that cool little claw that he has. And that's terrifying. He's something that literally cannot ever die. Well, you, can't, you can't kill a thought. That's true, and that is a badass weapon that he has. Oh, God, yeah. Well, not to mention, it's not the only thing. He can change himself, and he's, he's scary. I mean, he terrified me when I first watched it. Mike? Yeah, like, how about in part three when he became, like, that snake thing and was, like... Yeah, know, and he was like, eating that oh, chick? Scared the shit out of me. Dude, that was fucking cool. I, I still have nightmares about that, and I'm over 30, so... <laughs> See, the first one, the first one was terrifying for me. The rest of them were just good films, although, what was it, the second one? I, I thought they were pushing it, because to me, Freddy's not, like, a poltergeist that can control people... In the real world, I I didn't like that at all. I liked that aspect of it. Uh, For my part of it, I, I like Freddy. The first one, as I already said, was scary as hell. Freddy's a great fucking character. I think as it went on, he kind of became a parody of himself. I don't think it, they were taking quite enough time to maintain the quality. But uh, let's face facts. Sca- Number one, he is a scary motherfucker. Uh, what is it? Jason goes to hell. He has moments. Or not Jason goes to hell. Freddy versus Jason. He has moments where he's scary as fucking hell. And then uh, New Nightmare. He has some truly terrifying fucking moments in that. Freddy has great qualities to him. I'll definitely give you that. He does. That's the... Uh, and I like how you said New Nightmare. Because I like that too. Because it's he kind of like transcends the whole fantasy world of a movie. And kind of goes into reality. Which I think kind of like it breaks down the fourth wall yeah, the fourth wall which I think you know really is missing in a lot of movies so yeah no I like that and I like the fact that that was a nice way of kind of separating themselves of the power glove Freddy and Fre- Freddy's dead I mean really yeah now you're playing with power wait no now I'm playing with power he said or whatever I get that messed up all the time but you know to go back to the classic Freddy for a second with Nightmare 2, what did you think of the whole um, Freddy inside of Jesse type thing? Oh, I... See, that that's like Freddy possessing somebody. They kind of did something completely different with him. He's He was a dream demon. And to me, he always will be. Changing him into a poltergeist that can pretty much possess people, that kind of goes against... What Freddy was, you know, we were taught and brought up on. I mean, even though it's only the second movie. So I guess it could be tied into what we were taught and brought up on. But let, let me ask you this. How about the fact that you, you keep saying that he's a dream demon? Demons possess people. And in and, and part two, this was his <sighs> legitimate try at possessing somebody. It just, I don't know. I think I think they were just pushing it. He, he It's got a good thing going on, you know, killing people in dreams because that's scary. You actually bring him out where you can be possessed, like actually possess a human being. Then you start getting into like, well, then technically think about it. He could be exercised and then you could be done with him. Yeah, it, it does push it into a different kind of realm. It it wasn't as good. It was probably definitely my least favorite Freddy movie. Mm. I don't know about least favorite, but. I don't know. It's very homoerotic as well. And I mean, that's all in good, but not in a Freddy movie. 
Well, <laughs> I'm not going to take anything away. I did. I did enjoy that one. I thought some of the uh, poltergeist aspects and, and the possession aspects were really cool. Um, they were outside the realm of the normal nightmare. But what did you think of the remake? You, uh, I'm sorry. I, I'm a loyal Robert England fan. Robert England, to me, is the only one that can play Freddy. Yeah, I can't remember his name. Uh, Jackie Earl Haley. Really Jackie Earl That Haley. guy, yes. He, I mean, he did a good job. Yeah, and he definitely... Oh, great job. <laughs> He okay. made a really dark uh, I'm sorry, sir. Now we're going to fight. <laughs> now we're going to fight. How? How do you think that Jackie Earl Haley did a good job? I agree with Justine. I am a diehard Robert Englund fan. There is nobody else for Freddy. And, I mean, that guy was... And, and you know what? Going back to what we started with earlier with the slashers talking, Okay. He started out campy in that movie. There was nothing scary about him, sir. Okay, how do you say he started off campy? Because the way I remember it, he started off in the diner by remaining in the shadows until he popped up behind the kid and fucking cut his throat. That was badass. Right, okay, that was. But then you have him spewing out these one-liners constantly throughout the film after that point. Mm-hmm. There is that, but I think that was more out of necessity that they felt they had to do that for the fans of the original Nightmares. So they were trying to appeal to them by showing, I know we picked, you know, a different actor to play Freddy, even though that's blasphemy. So here's a few one-liners to make you feel more at home. Yeah. Uh, no, no I'll give you that. Uh, I, I can't I can't defend that. I'll give you that. But... I, I do like him. I, I thought his performance was good, and I'm just judging it outside the realm of the actor or any loyalty f to them, just on the properties of the film. I thought it was pretty good. Uh, the one aspect I really did like was like the anger and darkness that he brought to the character. I thought that was good and refreshing as to the campy humor that Robert Englund was, I, I'm going to assume, forced to do for the last couple films before New Nightmare and Freddy versus Jason. But you gotta figure. I mean, him cracking jokes and making these wise-ass comments, that's terrifying. Like, oh my god, this guy is going to tear me to shreds, and he's sitting there making jokes. This is a giant mind fuck. It worked. No, I, I, okay, I, I'll give you this. Watching it, it comes off as a little campy at times. Putting that aspect, I'd be losing my fucking shit that this guy is that in control and having so much fun with it that he's just cracking one-liners left and right. Well, I don't know. Another thing with the remake that I didn't like was I really think they went a little too far with the child molestation thing because the, or oh, God, the yeah. original didn't even really touch on that aspect. And now you have the remake kind of like overly harping on it, which it was overkill. It, yeah. Well, it's kind of like, I mean, and not, not putting it down or anything. It was a good movie and a cool aspect, but kind of like Rob Zombie's remake of Halloween. He spent a lot of time talking about what Michael was going through while he was actually a child in the hospital. And that's kind of what it seems like they were not following in the footsteps, but going along with the same line. So you think it almost fell prey to what a lot of modern films do of trying to explain it too much, explain out the background and the reason why instead of just letting it be the mystery that it should be. And that's what makes it scarier. You really don't know all the details, and that's terrifying. No, I will fucking agree with you there. A little bit of mystery is always good. Exactly. All right, I think you uh, nailed it uh, pretty good. The guy's scary as shit in quite a few films. He's demonic, and I think Mike and Justine uh, made their point a little bit and made me defend a little bit of ground as to why I actually do like the remake. And why you're wrong. And why I'm wrong. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yes, sir. There, look, there are probably few things that you're actually wrong about, but that is mm -hmm. definitely one of them, sir. I'm sorry, but it is. Well, if the masses want to feel that way, that's the beauty of this show. They can feel that way, and everyone is entitled to their opinion. Definitely, and we definitely want to thank um, our two callers, uh, Justine and Dylan, for calling in and taking the time to talk to us. Um, and, and you can catch all new episodes of The Morbidly Made when we debut in January. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you then. Thank you all.